Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Robert Schiller, the Arthur M. Oaken Professor of Economics, as well as a professor of finance at Yale School of Management. The New York Times best-selling economist is probably the only person to have predicted both the stock market bubble of 2000 and the real estate bubble that led up to the subprime mortgage meltdown. Yet he is no apologist for the sins of finance. Today we talk with Professor Schiller about his new and very timely book, Finance and the Good Society, where he argues that rather than condemning finance, we need to reclaim it for the common good. Welcome, Professor Schiller. Pleasure to be here. Let's begin with why you wrote this book. Well, I've been teaching finance for 25 years at Yale, mm -hmm. and I am launching young people on their careers. Now, Yale has an open Yale version of my lectures that are broadcast all over the world. So I'm developing people to be either directly in finance or to be somehow involved in, in finance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our s uh, I, I thought of myself as preparing people to live in our modern society, which is I call financial capitalism. Mm -hmm. But the, the crisis, the financial crisis that we've had since 2007 has a lot of people doubting the value of finance, and there's a lot of angry criticism. Occupy Wall Street. Sure. And so I feel... Uh, um, at sort of a quandary that I'm preparing students for what I'm sure is a good thing on the whole, mm -hmm. but people don't appreciate that. And I wanted to write a book which not only uh, shows the value of finance, but shows the way our society is going to evolve as a financial capitalistic society. Okay. Um, in your book, you write, financial capitalism is an invention, and the process of inventing it is hardly over. I don't think most people think of it in terms of that, and do you think that's part of the problem? Definitely, it's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. We appreciate when Apple Computer invents some new uh, system, mm -hmm. we are kind of awed by that, and we think that they deserve the money they earn. Right. But when, when we do something like securitize mortgages in finance, mm -hmm. it looks a little bit like somebody's scheme to get rich. Mm -hmm. And the benefits to society from securitizing mortgages are harder to see. It's not like you get some new fancy electronic gizmo that flashes and does amazing things. It's just that you can get a mortgage uh, at a lower rate and you actually get the mortgage mm -hmm. to buy a house. And so it's not as visible. But actually de designing something like a securitized mortgage takes a lot of work and creative inventiveness. Sure. In terms of the reputation of Wall Street today being so poor, and, and so many people have lost money, yet some people still continue to make millions upon millions of dollars, L let's look at some of the... Um, ways finance historically has contributed to society? Well, I would say that we are living in a period where the examples of the advantages of finance are all around us, all over the world. Mm -hmm. We are seeing the phenomenal growth of China, of India, and in fact, of just about any major seg segment of any emerging uh, economy. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is the, the financialization of the economies of the world. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is it's bringing people into modernity. Mm -hmm. It's bringing them good health care, clean homes, uh, all, all sorts of uh, wonderful things. Mm -hmm. And I really think those things would not have been possible if we stayed in a traditional, old-fashioned economy. Okay. Um, what do you think the role of finance should be for the good of society? Well, I think it, uh, it should be more dispersed. It should be broader than it is now. More democratic, perhaps? More democratic. That's the term I used in the book. Uh, that uh, there has been a process over centuries towards the democratization of finance. Mm -hmm. By that I mean... If you go back to the 18th century, 
not many people own stocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there weren't very many uh, corporations. Right. Uh, but that has spread out and developed uh, into mm -hmm. much more now. Well, uh, that is true. But for instance, take the situation we have on our hands now, where many people invested in the stock market and then lost significant um, portions of their mm -hmm. portfolio. How can we prevent or somehow negate that from happening down the road? Well, the world... Or can we? Right. The world is fundamentally uncertain. Mm -hmm. We don't know the future. And financial market fluctuations reflect that. Uh, but the, the uncertainty of the world can be managed substantially. Mm -hmm. We have a theory of risk management. There's a mathematical theory of it now. And uh, the, uh, there is also a behavioral theory that explains people's psychological problems in managing risk. But even if we don't know the future, there are things we can do to lessen the impact of them. Like what? Well, like diversify. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Invest and diversify. Uh, and when you say diversify, what do you mean? That means uh, the old adage is don't put all your eggs in, in one, one basket. basket. That makes yes. it sound obvious. Mm -hmm. But in that, as a matter of fact, most people don't, even today. So we, we have to get the word out. We need better investor education. Mm -hmm. We need better uh, advisors. We need advisors uh, that are available for mm -hmm. the more general public. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, w you know, it's part of the progress of civilization. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, as the years go by in coming decades, we will see financial institutions even more an integral part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And they will look different. The next 10, 20, 30 years will be different. How do you, do you have any insights as to what differences there may be? Well, it has to do with electronic technology. Mm -hmm. And we are all very used now to search engines and uh, algorithms of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we will have retail products that will help people manage their risks. Right now, not many people avail themselves of financial technology. They, they go through life owning a house mm -hmm. uh, that might lose value and suddenly they're wiped out, or they might specialize in a career and, and then the career turns out not to have been a wise choice mm -hmm. like you could become a nuclear engineer <laughs> and then we have <laughs> we have bad events and right. then suddenly you're not, you're in trouble these are all risks that people face mm -hmm. and as we democratize finance i think w i think we will see more and more help in managing these risks. Well, that's good because I think people do need help. I think for some people it can be overwhelming to try and understand what is going on in the financial market and how best you can navigate it to, yeah. you know, reap the benefits for yourself. Um, and a lot of people put their trust in financial advisors and that perhaps <laughs> may not always be the, the best right. way to go. Um, and in, in terms of that, I mean, you know, you talk about the sleaze factor in your book. Mm -hmm. How can we move away from that? Well, uh, the financial industry uh, is offers opportunities to make money in sleazy, manipulative mm -hmm. ways. Right. It's a little bit like politics, you know. They don't make maybe money, but they they have a sleaze factor problem as well. Uh, so I think that uh, we need. How do we deal with it? You know, in my book, I describe it as a moral issue right. for my students or, or other, any people who are in the industry. And it, it, it poses difficult problems. Mm -hmm. One problem is that there's always going to be sleazy people around you. Sure. And how do you deal with that? You get dragged down by them. Mm -hmm. And your own reputation is harmed by these other people. Uh, but I don't want one theme is that I don't, I think we have to be self-assured. Those of us who are doing business or mm -hmm. somehow related to finance, self-assured that I am a good person, I have a moral standard, and this is what we teach in business schools, uh, a kind of moral standard that underpins. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a sense of optimism in the book that most people are not sleazy, mm -hmm. and you have to be careful not to be over overreacting 
to some elements of sleazy. You know that e everyone messes up. There's okay. always some people. I think uh, you know the Occupy Wall Street people are very focused on some sleazy examples, but it's not it's not that uh, bad a situation. Okay. And I think it will gradually get better. And regulation helps with that as sure. well. And, and we're improving our regulatory apparatus. Especially with the, the crash of the market. And, and I, th I know many things have been put in place to uh, guard against that happening down the road. Um, some conclusions in your book. How can we reclaim finance and harness its power for the good of society? Give us some examples. Well, I can give you historical examples okay. of, of uh, important uh, invention. I, I, the stock market is an invention. Mm -hmm. It's a very smart invention in terms of what it provides for risk management, what it provides for human psychology, getting people involved, getting them incentivized to do coordinated work, to allocate. I could go on and on. I sound <laughs> like a theorist. Uh, but it's something that has to be improved. It's still not done. And there are so, and when you say it's it's not done yet, it needs to be improved, what can you cite one or two things that can be done to improve it? Well, one example that uh, is only about two years old, it's not my idea, but I mm -hmm. talk about it in the book, is uh, and it's a little subtle, a little bit hard to capsulize. There's a new kind of corporation called the Benefit Corporation, okay. which is now created in eight U.S. states. I, I, it's a U.S. thing. I, I think it will be exported to other countries eventually, but right now it's very small. It's just starting. Mm -hmm. A Benefit Corporation is different from a standard corporation in that its corporate charter says that it's not exclusively in the business of making profits. It has two objectives. A, profits for the shareholders. B, some other objective that is stated in the, at the time of the founding of the company mm -hmm. in its charter. And so you've got dual objectives. Mm -hmm. And these other objectives are maybe in conflict with the profit-making uh, motive. Uh, but I, I, I suspect that this new corporate form will be important and that even people who are interested in investing for the profits the company makes mm -hmm. will choose to invest in that kind of company. And in fact, that kind of company may turn out, it's an experiment now, mm -hmm. it may turn out to be better at making profits than a conventional corporation because it's more humane. Mm -hmm. It could be if the if some of the other purposes are human purposes right. about the community or society or, or the, the environment. environment. Right. And I think that this is an important innovation, mm -hmm. which we are just starting now here uh -huh. in, in the 21st century. Well, that's exciting. I hadn't heard about that. Is it, um, in, in terms of an entity, is it legally different from a regular corporation? Right. Okay. Huh, the law in the United States uh, has uh, imposed a duty of loyalty to the board of directors of a company, mm -hmm. loyalty to the shareholders. That is cardinal in U.S. law and in other countries as well. And so a m director who does something for the community would be violating the duty of loyalty mm -hmm. and could be subject to a lawsuit for doing that. So it's definitely a different legal structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we now have, and I think more and more states are going to adopt it, and foreign countries will adopt okay. it. Are these being traded now currently on Wall Street? Yeah. They're part uh, of the stock market? Uh, they are, but I don't have a big hit list of companies sure, I, to I give understand, you. Sure, I understand, I understand. I just am new. curious. Okay, very good. Final question, Professor. If there was one thing that we can take from your book, what would you want it to be? Uh, well, having written a long book, there are many <laughs> things in it. I know, I know. But, but uh, I think uh, I think that we should be thinking of financial capitalism as a kind of organization for society that uh, res respects human differences, respects the different contributions that different people can make, and it doesn't put people in a straitjacket. It doesn't put them in a 
you know, you belong to some institution, now take orders from your boss. That may happen too, but what I'm saying is there's an element of self-reliance and an element of everyone's on the lookout for how to make a better society. Uh, we have, it, it, it will be integrated with our modern electronic uh, uh, new capabilities mm -hmm. and search, but I think that people with this, uh, th the world is never going to be perfect, but I think that people will be able to find their purposes. They'll, they'll find fulfillment of their deepest purposes better. It's not about making money. Mm -hmm. Money is only to be spent for some purpose. And I think what I want my students and anyone who reads this book is to come into business or finance with a high-minded purpose. We don't tell you what the purpose is, mm -hmm. but we, I, I, you know, I, we hope that anyone who does go into business or finance will have some higher purposes that ultimately all of this striving is, uh, is aimed at. Very good. Finance and the Good Society. Fascinating <laughs> stuff. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing it with us. My pleasure. For more information about Professor Robert Schiller, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through the funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.